My name is Joe Hudson. I'm one of the youth representatives on the um, management plan steering group. Each national park has a management plan which sets out objectives over a period um, and the management plan steering group monitors these objectives um, and ensures that they're being met and also then writes a new management plan at the end of the uh, time period. I'm also part of um, Upskill Downdale, which is a group of volunteers who uh, volunteer within the National Park doing a range of activities. And uh, these two roles are under the umbrella programme of Generation Green, which is a pot of money which DEFRA, which is the Department for Environmental and um, Food and Rural Affairs, um, and they give to the, all the national parks in England um, to promote opportunities among younger people. So I'm, I live in the Dales in Malham um, and I'm very passionate about um, protecting this incredible landscape um, and I also wanted to make a difference um, and this was given through the opportunity to be on the management plan steering group. Who are you and what's your role within the Yorkshire Dales National Park? Well my name's David Butterworth and I've got one of the best jobs in the country. I'm the Chief Executive of the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority. What does that mean? It means that I manage a team of about uh, 120, 125 people uh, across a range of specialisms, farm conservation, archaeology, woodland creation, habitats, planning, visitor services, etc, etc, to try to work with the people who own and manage this land to make this the best it can be for this country, achieving a whole range of objectives. So firstly, what are national parks? Um, well, the United Kingdom was quite slow coming to the national park movement, really. Um, the first national park ever designated in the world was in the United States in 1872, Yellowstone National Park. And then the, the kind of rest of the world uh, took on this idea of, of designating these beautiful areas. But in the UK, it took a lot longer. and There was a lot of pressure built up for, for two reasons, I suppose. One was... Um, the importance of conserving what were even then recognised in the late 19th, early 20th century as fantastic areas, fantastic locations. Uh, but the other one was that there was a real demand for access to these areas because access was severely restricted. And it led to some serious conflicts, particularly in the 1930s, uh, uh, which culminated in a very famous mass trespass at Kinder Scout, uh, where people had their heads cracked and were some, some were imprisoned. And this seems extraordinary now, you know, for, for getting access to a, to a fantastic landscape like this, that you could be in prison, but that was the situation. So then we kind of get up into the Second World War. And I suppose the creation of national parks in the UK was, it was part of that post-Second World War reconstruction under the, the Labour administration. And I suppose it was, was, was creating a landscape that was fit for the heroes who fought in the Second World War. So uh, an act was passed in 1949, seems a long time ago, it would seem a long time ago to you, it's, it seems so long to me, um, which created national parks for the first time in the United Kingdom. And then they started to get what we call designated the Peak District the first, 1951, the Dales in 54, and we've got 15 national parks now, three in Wales, two in Scotland and 10 in England. So what are national parks' purposes? Uh, it's quite clear in terms of what Parliament has set out the purposes uh, are for national parks. There's two really. One is the conservation and enhancement of this fantastic landscape, the wildlife, the beauty, the habitats and the cultural heritage of the area which is important. And the second purpose is to promote people's understanding and enjoyment of these amazing landscapes. So why is the Yorkshire Dales a national park? Uh, because it's the finest landscape in Western Europe. A, 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 a trite answer, but you know, here we are this morning uh, at Aysgar Falls, and it is, look at it, it is really something else, isn't it? Why is the Yorkshire Dales a national park? Because of this. Uh, it's a national park because it's got particular qualities that were recognised in the 1950s when it went through its designation uh, process. Uh, and they are, you know, the incredible uh, array of dales that we have in this area, internationally famous now, Wensleydale, Wharfdale, Ribblesdale, uh, just a, a, an amazing, um, amazing plethora of, of, of landscapes. We've got this 
extraordinary barns and walls landscape, which is again internationally recognised as being very Dale specific. Some of the finest habitat within Western Europe, 25% of the Dales is internationally and nationally recognised for its, for its designation. Uh, we've got the greatest underground caving system in the United Kingdom. I could go on, uh, but you can see some of the reasons, some of the special qualities as to why the Dales was designated. So is there certain criteria that an area must meet to become a national park? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's really examining the conservation value of that area and then looking at whether it's possible to actually get public enjoyment for, for the area. And if you meet those two criteria, then you can be designated as a national park. That process, incidentally, at the moment, is carried out by Natural England. Uh, but from the 1940s and 50s onwards, it was initially by the National Parks Commission, the Countryside Commission, the Countryside Agency, and now Natural England. Right. Um, and so, what are the unique qualities of the Yorkshire Dales National Park? Well, I've mentioned some of them. Uh, this plethora of hay meadows that we've got, hay meadows under serious attack since the 1940s with some of the, of the farming methods that have been undertaken. Uh, but still in the Dales, you can see some extraordinary hay meadow. Swaledale Muker in, in spring and early summer is something, something to behold. And I hope to see lots more of those going forward into the future. It's got some of the best archaeology in the country, some of the best habitats, the international habitats that I was referring to earlier. Uh, it just goes on. You could almost have this, this list of 20, 30 things that are very special to the Yorkshire Dales. And so what's your favourite bit of the Yorkshire Dales? Uh, it's not in Yorkshire. I'm not sure I should say that really, should I? Uh, I've got into trouble for this before, but uh, I love Dentdale. Now, if you talk to the people in Dentdale, they say they still are in Yorkshire and they've completely ignored the boundary changes that took place in 1974 when it was part of the West Riding and then went into what is now Cumbria. But I love Dentdale and I love the new part of the park. What I mean by that is... Um, it's about 850 square miles, the Yorkshire Dales. Uh, but in 2016, very recently, it grew by about a quarter uh, when uh, parts of uh, Western Cumbria and a little bit of Lancashire, that pleases me so much, were brought into the Yorkshire Dales National Park. The highest hill in Lancashire is now in the Yorkshire Dales National Park. It's a wonderful thing to do. Great news for Lancashire. Sorry. But those new areas, I think, are just stunning. The Orton Fells, Malastang, Barben, you know, some really, really beautiful areas in the West. And because they're quite new to the Yorkshire Dales National Park, I still find those to be the most exciting part. So why was the National Park extended? Uh, some of the reasons we were talking about before uh, apply here. When the park was first designated in 1954, there was a bit of a cop-out by, uh, by the people who carried out that designation process. And, and if you can just imagine it, <clears throat> you've got a couple of blokes driving around the place in an Austin 7 with a map, looking at places and going, hmm, that's, that's good, you know, with a thick felt tip pen. So the, the kind of, that, thick, that thick felt tip pen caused us some problems, incidentally, in the future, when we were trying to work out where, where the boundary was. But they're driving around and they're going, hmm, that's... You know. The cop-out was... The final boundary in 1954 was determined largely by the political county boundaries that existed at that time. So, for example, the boundary over in the west, which we're, we're talking about, it, it encompassed the old West Riding County Council. And the boundary went right over the top of the Howgill Fells. So you could stand at the top of this incredible range of hills with one foot in the Yorkshire National Park and one outside it. But you'd look round and go, well, what's that about? What it's about is drawing a boundary on politi for political reasons, on political boundaries. So coming to your question, the reason why they were designated was 50 years later, after a lot of pressure, somebody said, that can't be right. When you designate a national park, you can't take any notice of political boundaries. You have to have a look at the landscape. You have to see what's on the ground. You have to see what gets into your gut when you're in that area. So Natural England went through a process of looking at those areas and saying, yeah, this is crackers. This is absolutely crackers. So they designated the northern Howgills into the Yorkshire Dales National Park as the southern Howgills had been 
1954, but they went much further than that. They went up the Malastang Valley and said, this is amazing. This is cool. They went into the Orton Fells, almost up to Penrith, and said, this is coming in. And then they went south, south of Sedba, into Barbendale. And then they went into the, that bit of Lancashire, a little cheese slice in, La in Lancashire that, that was worthy of designation. If you speak to Lancastrians, then we've got a lot working for us. They'll tell you that far more of Lancashire should have come in, but we'll leave that for another day. And so now climate change becomes quite a pertinent issue. So how can the National Park um, help mitigate the effects of climate change? Yeah. I think that's the most pressing issue for us as a national park uh, now and into the future. Uh, two things I'd say about it. First of all, as an organisation, we have to take that seriously, and we have been. It was a bit of an irritation to me a couple of years ago that so many bodies were declaring a climate emergency. A climate emergency in 2019. You've known about that for a long time. We started looking at our own emissions in 2005. So by 2019, we'd already gone carbon neutral. We'd moved into there. We cut our own emissions by 70%, and the other 30% was offset by tree planting. Our board have said, that's not good enough. 70%'s not good enough. So by 2030, we will have cut our emissions by 99%. Never mind offsetting. That'll take us into carbon negatively, carbon, a negative, carbon negative body, which is really quite important to us. So as a... As an organisation, if we're serious, you need, to, you need to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. But the bigger issue is this area, 850 square miles. The opportunities to make a significant impact on carbon emissions here are greater, I would suggest, than probably anywhere else in the United Kingdom. We've got peatland here that is internationally renowned, but it's damaged. And carbon is, is being released from these peatlands. But we've been working with a, a body called uh, the Yorkshire Peat Partnership uh, for about 12 years now in bringing that peatland back into good condition. Because if it's in good condition, not only does carbon not come into the atmosphere, but it soaks more carbon up. And there's the ability to soak carbon up in those peatlands that is as great as the combined forests of Germany and France. That's how significant they are. So that's a big deal. We've done about 50% um, uh, of, those, of those peatlands, bringing them back into, in, into good use. There's another 50%, but it costs a lot of money. But we're still on with that, working with some fantastic partners. The other thing is tree planting. <clears throat> the Dales has the lowest proportion of trees of any national park in the United Kingdom. And yet every one in 10 trees that is planted in England in the last 10 years has been planted here in the Dales. We've accelerated that programme of tree planting again. It's important that they're planted in the right place as you don't plant trees on peatland, for example. That just exacerbates the problem. But through that combination of getting that peat back into good condition and an extensive programme of tree planting, I think we can make a significant impact on climate change in this area. And I think that's our responsibility as well because the next generation that comes along really should be looking at my generations and the ones that went before and said, You've known about that for some time. What did you do about it? And I think that's a very valid question. Now, it's interesting you talk about the peatland. I don't think people realise just how important peatland can be for, for mitigating climate change and how much carbon peatland actually stores. Mm, yeah, It's our rainforest. Mm. <laughs> it's the UK's rainforests. But you talk about, you know, bogs and peat, and it's kind of, mm, yeah, mm, yeah. But that is so, so important for the issues that we're talking about here. But there is work going on. It just needs to continue to be funded into the future. Thank you. And so going forward, what do you think the future of the Oxdales National Park is? Um, seeing loads of people come, come in and visit the, uh, the National Park, but also um, managing climate change, which is becoming a, a particular issue. Yeah. There is a... a a contradiction I suppose in some of that because there are, there are three aspects of that there's there's the value of this area for in conservation terms for its habitats for its woodlands etc there's the fact that we're facing the most serious issue that the planet has ever faced in terms of uh, the growth in temperatures and the problems associated with carbon emissions and there's the fact that if Covid has shown nothing else 
it's shown that these places are absolutely critical to the health and well-being of millions of people. So how do you manage that all together? I think that's the role of the National Park Authority, to try to deliver on those, on those three things. I would say that the importance of climate mitigation and nature recovery go hand in hand, really. Uh, but I'm more optimistic about that than I've been for some considerable time. The changes that are taking place in farming, I think are really important, particularly farming in the uplands. There's opportunities there for farmers and land managers to produce good food, to deal with the impacts of climate change, and to assist in, in nature recovery in a way that there's not been, that's not been done before. And I think most farmers as well recognise the value of the visitors, of tourism. You know, the, you won't remember, but in 2001, when foot and mouth came along and decimated these areas, the importance of the visitor economy to a place like the Dales was seen in absolutely explicit terms. And I think many farmers and land managers still understand that. So they can also deal with the access side of things to make this place a, you know, a wonderful place for everyone to come to. So, so our role is in terms of managing all those things. And we can do that. We can do that. We can deliver on that. Hi, my name's John Ty. I'm the Estates Manager for the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority. Um, that involves looking after our properties. So we have around 20 properties uh, spread all throughout the Dales. Um, so I look after the maintenance of those and all the capital works to keep them running and keep them running into the future. So the carbon reporting is sort of part of the estate's remit. So we need to, um, as a national park, report our, our carbon um, output for all of our properties. So when we're looking at that, we um, look at things like the insulation in properties, the, the heating systems, and, and that all falls under estate. So whilst you sort of, when you're looking at um, carbon action plans in, in and around the national park, there's kind of two parts to it. There's sort of the outside realm, which is landscapes and tree planting and, um, and carbon being put into the ground through peat um, replenishment, but also in properties. But properties plays a massive part in carbon reduction and, and, and they're one of the biggest emitters you'll find. And that's largely through the heating systems. Um, so with any sort of natural heating system that most buildings have, which uh, uses gas or a lot of buildings use oil, um, to get that into the property, it produces a large amount of CO2 to heat the actual property. So we need to start looking at ways that we can um, offset that and use renewable technology. So putting in things that use electricity and things like air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, um, putting in solar panels on our roofs, um, all of that can bring down our our carbon output on our properties. So these are our two air source heat pumps at the Aysgarth Visitor Centre. Um, they've replaced uh, electric storage heaters that used to be throughout the building. Um, so these things are about four times more efficient than the electric storage heaters that we used to have, um, which is obviously leads to quite a massive saving on electricity, which has both a reduction in our carbon output and also uh, on our costs as well. So these things work um, basically is a, a kind of a fridge in reverse um, and what they do is they kind of suck air in which then goes over a coil that has a refrigerant in it and what that does is the air heats up the refrigerant um, from just the outside air temperature and then that refrigerant is compressed through the system and put over a heat exchanger which then heats up the water and goes around the building so it's a fairly complicated system but very efficient. The, the uh, National Park Authority um, declared a climate emergency in September 2019 um, and at that they set some, some sort of very stringent um, targets for us to meet. So the aim was that by 2030 um, our total greenhouse gas emissions um, for what we do were going to be reduced by 95% and, um, and that by 2025 they were going to be reduced by at least 85%. So there were quite high targets um, to try and meet but obviously the climate emergency is something that can't be ignored. So whilst the authority um, is looking to help farmers improve how they farm the land and uh, reduce um, the carbon that's produced from that, um, whilst our Trees and Woodlands team are helping to plant hundreds of thousands of trees around the Dale and, and fund that Dales and fund that every year, um, the authority realised it needed to get its own house in order and, uh, and to sort of show by example what you can do to your properties to retrofit them. From that, 
the um, members asked us to put together a carbon reduction plan, um, which was going to look at our existing emissions from all our properties, how we heat them, how we light them, um, how staff use them, and to put in place renewable energy um, solutions to solve that. So that was putting in air source heat pumps at two of our centres. Um, we have ground source heat pumps at our head office, uh, biomass boilers at our museum and another one of our offices, um, upgrading all our lighting to LED in all our properties um, and obviously improving all the insulation we have. So the aim of all of that will be to hit our target of 95% carbon reduction by 2030. Um, not only did we reduce our CO2 that we're, we're outputting as an authority, but um, it also saves us money as well. Um, we, we're looking at once all our measures are introduced, probably saving about £20,000 a year um, across our properties. So once we knew that we, we, we had the buy-in from um, senior management, we were able to go out there and look at, to get grants. We were successful with a couple of different government grants. Then really in the space of about 12 months, we managed to, to do all of it. Um, get air source heat pumps in, in the sites, electric... Uh, LED lights everywhere, uh, vehicle chargers in 10 of our car parks, um, and a whole host of other things. So John, what have we got here? Yeah, so this is our, our biomass boiler, um, which heats the Dales Museum, which is just up there. Um, what it does is it uses pellets, which are delivered from a sustainable source. So it's um, from managed woodland. Uh, the reason it's sort of classed as sustainable is because when they, when they um, cut down those forests and make it into pellets that we burn, they also replant those forests and replant even more back. So it is a sustainable source of heating. Um, and we've got Matt, who's our area manager, who can maybe talk us through it a bit more about how it works. OK, Joe, well, at this end, we've got the wood pellet that gets brought into the boiler by means of this mechanical auger. So the wood pellet comes in from the store. So there's a, when the store's full, there's about eight tonnes of wood pellet in there. Um, that gets drawn into the boiler via the auger with this mechanism here, drops the pellet in at this end, and then comes into the, uh, the main part of the system in here, which is the boiler itself. So the wood pellet gets dropped down onto the, uh, onto the burning grate, um, and we get the perfect combination of heat and oxygen on there the wood pellet is the fuel, so those three essential items for the fire triangle. So that generates lots of heat. And then um, we turn that into heat and heat to heat the building by, um, by heating water. So at this end of the building, we've got the water accumulator. Um, so there's about 4,000 litres of water in here. And this circulates uh, into the boiler, past where the boiler is heating up. Um, and then back out. So this water circuit is a fixed circuit in here. So we've got about 4,000 litres of, of really hot water. Um, we then turn that into heat for the Countryside Museum because we've got a fixed heating system from the Countryside Museum, so that's also a sealed circuit. And that sealed circuit passes by very close to the sealed circuit in this boiler room here. And that passes by in a thing called a heat exchanger, which is that there. Okay, so that passes the heat, that exchanges the heat from this really hot water in here um, into that slightly cool water that's coming back from the countryside museum. Um, and so then it sends hot water back up into the museum and that heats the underfloor heating and the radiators and other bits and pieces that need heating up in that museum. So you mentioned this is a sustainable heating source. Now how sustainable is it considering you're burning wood pellets to uh, heat the water? Well first off Joe, um, it's a move away from, from using fossil fuel as a, as a source of heating so that's got to be a good thing. Um, and um, yeah it's not perfect um, and it needs to go in hand in hand with a combination of other measures such as you know we've improved insulation in the building up there because um, there's no point in you know, heating a building that's, that's not insulated as well as it could be. So you know, there's a lot of time and money that's gone into improving that as well. So um, yeah, it's not perfect, but you know, we're, you know, we're trying to keep up with technology. And even since this was installed um, nearly 10 years ago, you know, things have changed and moved on. So um, you know, we'll look to do what, what we can in the future. Yeah, so, yeah like Matt said, um, it's, it's a much better sort of first step to move away from burning fossil fuels. So 
we're probably looking in the next maybe four to five years of upgrading this system and, and see if there's there's a better option. Something like a ground source heat pump would work quite well because we've got quite a lot of land around here. Um, or additionally, air source heat pumps might become even more efficient and, and the price might come down. So that might be the next step to move us away from, from actually burning something, even though it is more sustainable than fossil fuels. So you've got some solar panels on the roof of the Countryside Museum here in Hawes. How, are they, how do they fit in with the National Parks um, Climate Reduction Programme? Yeah, so we, we have solar panels installed at quite a few of our sites now. Most of the properties where we could install solar panels, we, we have done. Um, and they, they do produce quite a lot of electricity actually and it's a situation where um, financially you're probably looking at about six to eight years they, they'll pay for themselves so whilst there's quite a big upfront cost um, within six to eight years they'll pay for themselves and then for the rest of the time you're basically getting free electricity out of it so you're probably in a, in a sunny area not on a day like this um, you may be looking at about 20 to 30 percent of your electricity that comes from the solar panels that you can use in the site for the year um, so they're, they're just a part, a, sort of a package of things you can do to your building to just make it more sustainable and if you've got the roof space, why, why wouldn't you do it?